Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. My name's Karen Harper Cuss, and I'm here to be the chair for our talk today on slow interiors, understanding the importance of heritage. It's so lovely to see people in real life, I can't tell you. Um, it's a topic that's very dear to my heart, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. The concept of slow interiors, you can come at it in so many different ways. And obviously, we're looking at it from a professional context today and talking about how to take clients on an enjoyable, thoughtful journey and thinking about longevity of design in their homes and the benefits and challenges that might present. So I'm going to introduce you to our panelists. Um, first of all, Henry Prideau. Um, Henry is an interior designer known for creating elegant, authentic British homes, blending different styles and giving a modern take on classic interiors. Um, he's honed his skills at some of the UK's most renowned design practices and established his in 2014 and he provides a personal service for private residential and boutique commercial clients who are keen to invest in the creative process. Um, Sarah Cosgrove is a multidisciplinary designer with studios in London and Dublin. You'll hear her beautiful dulcet Irish tones in a minute. Um, she has two parts to her business, the Sarah Cosgrove Studio and Grove & Co. And she's an extensive knowledge of three different sectors, residential, hospitality, and business management. And she loves to integrate old and new to create timeless interiors. Jay Blades, I'm sure you all recognize um, as TV presenter of many programs, including The Repair Shop and Jay's Yorkshire Workshop, which makes me cry every time I watch it. Um, <laughs> he's an eco-designer and a social enterpriser, passionate champion of restoration, believing the old can become new again, the broken can be fixed, and that aligns with his belief that humans can be repaired and rejuvenated as well. And then Olivia Uhtred is, uh, before setting up her practice, she studied for a degree in interior and spatial design at Chelsea College of Arts. Um, she worked under Philip Hooper at Sybil Colfax and John Fowler and headed up the design division of Stone with Lulu Little. And she's a very layered approach to residential and commercial interiors very keen on calling them unfussy and not looking too designed, and again, loves using antiques and textiles. So we, got, we want to cover a lot of ground, so we're gonna start, and we wanted to focus first on um, thinking about the property that you're working with and the importance of being sensitive to architectural inheritance. So Henry, um, obviously that's the first step, assessing the home. What part do you think that plays in a slow interior? Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, wh whenever I'm working on a project, I, I generally think there are three different briefs that I'm immediately uh, going to be looking at when I, when I go into the house. One is, what does the client want? Uh, the second one is, what do I want? What do I want to achieve out of the project? But the third one, and importantly for this, is what does the house want? What does the house deserve and need? Because there are so many beautiful buildings out there and it's very easy to just go in and take all sorts of things out um, whereas actually what I, I really like to do is look at the architecture and work out what we can save um, and it, you can't always save everything but it's always really it's always important for me to put back things that, that would have been in the house when it was first built to make it make it more authentic um, I'm just working on a just finished working on a listed building where one of the most important things was the is the plan form of the house. So doors had been moved, so we put doors back to the right locations, um, and making sure as you move up the house that the, the structure is in place as it would have been at that time. And you can still open things up, make things you know a little bit more open plan or broken plan even, um, but it's important to ensure that. The original features, if they're not if they're not there, we reinstate them. If they are there, we make them good, um, and that's something that you know I take to heart every time I'm working on a project. No, I, I agree, Henry. Sorry, hi everybody, I'm Sarah, and um, it's critical. I think it's often a home when you walk into it is telling you what it wants to be and what it can be. And I think it's getting that balance between reinstating maybe some of the original features, but then also looking at the opportunities from a modern perspective. So it's trying to always find that balance. And I think slow interiors is about just, I think, an, an increased thoughtfulness to the spaces that we're dealing with and the items that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, because 
we all know we're going at 300 miles an hour. We've had this reset of the last 18 months, and I think it's given us all time to do maybe more research, be more thoughtful in terms of how we approach things, and, and try and get off the treadmill a bit and, 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 and try and approach design in a, in a more considered way. You know, I don't know what you guys think. I, I, sorry, um, I just want to say hello to everybody, but also I kind of forgot the question. So I'd like to have the question again, please. So thinking about... I was just, I was touching this wallpaper <laughs> and it's just really cool. It's, um, sorry, what is the question? And I'll answer it this time. Sensitivity to architectural inheritance, but you might think also yeah. about the pieces that are within that. I normally that think about, yeah, yeah, I normally think about the pieces that were inside um, a house. I don't normally get involved with the architecture. It's more the, I call it feathering the nest. So making sure that the nest looks quite well and it looks in timely to what is the house was or the architecture. So for me, it's all about feathering the nest. Yeah, so I'll take care of that. Do you want to answer that? Oh, you've got something to say. Do you know what? I actually have something to say. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. It's so lovely to see so many, so many faces here today and just so great to be here. It was so sad missing it last year. Uh, I can't wait to get outside and see what's going on. But um, in terms of, I, I agree with everything Henry said. When, when I'm starting a house, I like to imagine holding the, tipping the house upside down and whatever is stuck down, I would like to retain it. Or if it's in a bad state, I'd like to look into the, what, it, what it should have been historically and put it in again. And that applies to skirting boards, floors, architraves, doors, um, panelling, and everything that's stuck down and all the beautiful plaster work on ceilings too. And then we, after that, we can start the more sort of fun, I suppose, thing, which is decorating the house, which is what people think interior designers do, <laughs> even though there's a bit more to it than that a lot of the time. I think it's also about striking the balance between respecting the past, but also the fact that we're going to be living in a house in the future. So it still needs to work for, you know, for us now, rather than just slavishly trying to stick to something old. It's about making something feel authentic, but also applicable to modern living. Um, thank you. I think those are such thoughtful um, insights. Um, Olivia, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that sort of um, the key benefits of taking a thoughtful, considered approach to the conceptual stage and the d room design itself at the beginning. <coughs> I think most clients have a um, timing issue when they start a project and they want to get started right now. They've often got a date in mind that they want to either move into the house or the space. And we have to slow it down. We have to say, okay, let's get our concept sorted for this house. Let's get our design language sorted for this house. Because if we can get it spot on and the client loves it and we all know the direction we're going in, it's going to avoid lots of changes and changes mean money and the client losing money. So if you can relay that to your client and put in that time at the beginning, even though it frustrates some, some clients, you get your concept absolutely spot on and, and know where you're going. You know, you're, you'll be working on this house probably or, or building for a couple of years. You need to map out the direction you're going in first. And I particularly love interiors that are um, that look really laid back and almost as if an interior designer hasn't really been there. So I like interiors to look as if they've been things in them have been collated over time. So that means using lots of antiques. It means using vintage pieces. It means using textiles on the upholstery. It means hand painted lampshades. It also means hand crafted things because they have often been made in the same way for centuries. So for example, if you're using rush matting or something on the floor, it's, it's made the same way now as it was a couple of hundred years ago. So really, when you pop that in, the, the interior actually looks as if it, it, it looks like it's been there for ages. And suddenly you walk in and you, and you say, oh, you know, has this house been, you know, when did you do the house? And I know it was done a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I've sweated over it. <laughs> But actually, it looks like it could have been done a long time ago. And that's something I really, really love doing is making interiors that look as if the client has picked things out over their travels and things. But actually, it's a sort of faked approach. Generally, I've done that. How easy is it to slow a client down? <laughs> well, that's really hard, Karen. <laughs> um, I think that 
getting a client excited about a concept is the way to slow them down, getting them to enjoy the process. And that could be surrounding them with millions of books, all these fantastic books, and you could open them on various pages and say, look, do you want to go in this direction? This is a timeless interior by Robert Klein. Is that your, your feeling? Or do you want to go Jacques Grange cool? You know, that's very different in look, but so much fun. And then we do a style search where we get all the fabrics out on the table. Are you into velvets? Are you into linens? Are you sort of dry textures kind of person? Or are you, you want things a little bit smarter than that? And that's developing a concept, actually. And if they're enjoying it, they'll latch onto it. So make it fun. <laughs> If you can. <laughs> and, and it's developing a relationship with that client, and that doesn't come straight away either. And by the end, you might be friends with these people, but you know, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and th the best projects really are when the relationship works, works well, and you, you can sign off and they pay the final bill and everyone's smiling <laughs> still. That, that's what we're all aiming for, isn't it? And yes, believe me, it's really hard to get to that stage after a number of years of working on a project, but... Um, repeat clients are, um, are proof that this can work, and it, it does work. And do you know what? We actually love to bring pieces. We love clients that are bringing pieces with them. So when we start an interior, actually one of our first questions is, is there any piece of art? Are there any things that are really meaningful and dear to you? And let's bring them. Let's, you know, just starting a new project doesn't mean everything has to be brand new. And... and it's actually whether you're wor working on an old house or a new house, the more that you can bring the collected items, those pieces that have been on the journey with them, the more integrity and depth you're going to get into that home. And I think that's one of the hardest things because, you know, you're working this huge project. It's taken years, stress, money, all the sleepless nights for everybody involved, clients and designers and builders and everybody. <coughs> and the truth is, at the end of the day, you want them to feel connected to the home they've created. And if you've just put your whole, you know, if, if it's not about them, you, you've missed the point. And that's the idea with the slow interior. If the more in time invested up front and the more they're connected to the decision-making process, the more likely when they get those keys, they're gonna feel connected to the space that's being created, you know? <laughs> yeah, to slow interiors, I, I, I come from it from a, completely different angle. Sometimes I give the client less choice. So if you give them too much choice, and then next thing you know, there's all these colors, all these fabrics, everything that just kind of like blows their mind away. Um, for me, I work with a limited amount of fabrics and fabric houses and colors. It's really quite toned down, as in that's all I work with. If you want something else, I recommend you go to someone else. Don't really deal with me because I am the way that I am, because I, I prefer to be that way and I think it's easier for me for me to just be okay that's what I do I don't do anything else so I can be so slow that um, I miss a lot of things I miss the trends I miss the color changes I just stick with that one thing and if somebody wants it they'll come along and if they ask me to change something that I've got in my um, shop I know this isn't really PC to say but I I don't change it I keep it the way it is because that's how slow my movement is it's just like slow interior this is what I offer and I don't change anything else. So it's slightly different. No, I think that's a great point. And actually, I was going to come on to trends, really, because that is, you know, everything's driven towards making people want to buy more and get fed up with it more quickly. Um, and that's a fine line for all of you to balance, isn't it? Because you want to be offering something that feels current, um, but it also has to have longevity. So how, how do you tread that line? I'll jump in there, <laughs> if that's okay. <laughs> um, if you want to uh, have buy furniture, I would say, and, and you want it to feel current, I'd say, obviously, when you're antique shopping um, or buying old, old furniture, or you just buy such good, the most, the best quality stuff you can afford, because once you've um, had it reupholstered, it will last for absolutely ages. It's probably last for 200, 300 years before you've got your hands on it anyway. So I think we can, we can say just invest in well-made, properly made furniture, and then you can add your current feeling, um, you know, your current fabric um, onto it as upholstery. 
and it could be something that you really love or that's been in your family for a long time or something that's been picked up in the travels of the client to really make them connect with it, just going back to Sarah's point, which I think is so valid. And, and I think it comes down to design as well. It's not just quality. It's a good design piece can, can sort of slip into many different types of interior. And a trendy piece will go out of fashion in 10 years and then you're replacing it. Um, and you know, we see lots of new products here, which are great, but it's always interesting to see which ones stick around. Um, and therefore, in a way, you're sort of saving money over time. But y you know, you're investing in pieces that are, that are gonna last a long time, and that's, that's really important to a, an, a slow interior maybe doesn't need to change much in the future. Um, it is nice to mix things up a bit, but you don't want to be buying stuff all the time. It just doesn't, I don't think it works like that for a lot of people. Well, when we were chatting, um, I had individual chats with all of them before, before we did this, which was lovely. Um, somebody mentioned about the sort of ethos of do it once and do it well, which really resonated with me. Um, and I, I think maybe that is where a professional eye has always got that. You've got so much experience over the years. And also I was thinking about how with sourcing, your um, little black books are so much bigger than the average person. So y where for a lay person like myself, where you're going to try and find that gorgeous antique chandelier that fits your home, it's going to take me an awful lot longer. That it, I will be a lot slower at the sourcing than you will. So you can create a slow look more quickly than the average person. Um, does anyone want to say, I was thinking also about the sort of si um, saving on money and irreparable mistakes. Is there any other comments you wanted to make on that area? Sort of saving money and not making a mistake by rushing in. Well, well I mean, it's interesting what you're saying about the chandelier. I mean, it's, it's okay if you don't find it straight away as long as you do find the right one. Um, and all of us will probably be able to just go to a, a specific place and find something straight away that will suit your needs. Um, it obviously comes down to budget as well. It's nice if you have big budgets to work with, but we don't always have that luxury. Um, you, you do quite a few large sort of, sh not necessarily show homes, but multi-unit projects, and you probably don't have ginormous budgets, but then maybe on my personal residential projects there are slightly bigger budgets um, or for, for specific items. Um, but yeah, I, th I think finding the right piece, if it does take time, that's okay. Which comes back to kind of what Olivia was saying about getting that concept right and then gradually finding those pieces that will fit into that look um, over a period of time. Thank you. That's, um, the other area I sort of wanted to touch on was really going back to the client and taking them on that journey with you. It's quite an education process, isn't there, involved um, in maybe managing expectations. And I just wondered, given that all of, if you're dealing with a very high-end client and they're used to fast results in business or whatever they do, the instant decisions, how do you educate them um, on the journey that they're about to go on? Do you want to start, Sarah? So back to what Henry was saying, you know, when you take on a new client, it's not like you're going to know the inside of their thoughts from the very beginning. But I do think quite quickly you realize how much these clients want to be involved. So we've got clients that literally, they're like, we're hiring you, please go off and do this touch base with us on key points that we'll see in two years when it's finished. And then we've got other clients who are literally, you know, every thread that's going into the fabric, they want to know where it is, where it's coming from. So you're really trying to respond to the individual clients. But to your point, like we, we do this a lot. Um, we know where to find things. We know how long things take. We know the things that, you know, the pitfalls that may lie ahead. So it's trying at the beginning to really educate them, but then excite them. And I think the one thing about, say, using uh, vintage pieces, antique pieces, is they can actually go and sit on them and look at them. They mightn't be the right finish or the right fabric, and we'll work on that, but the truth is they're actually able to see the item in 3D long before they purchase it. Whereas when you're doing more bespoke items that take longer, they're a big commitment. If they go wrong, they go horribly wrong, as we've all <laughs> known. Um, and, um, you know, so you've got to really respond to how much of the journey they want to go on and how much education they want. And like seeing the hand-drawn you know, sketches, we work with an amazing guy in Dublin called Peter Christopher Carroll. He does these, I mean, quite 
frankly, museum quality pieces of bespoke furniture. And just to see his sketches, how he develops his finishes, all of that, it's exciting for the client to feel that they're going to be getting something truly unique to them and actually what is potentially a future classic, you know? And I think that's what we're trying to create, create timeless elements that then can be refreshed and upgraded. But actually, if you get the envelope right and you get the overall form and structure right, it's, it's going to take them, you know, on a much further journey than if it's just a trend or something that you kind of rush in, do and get out of, you know? And even on the multi-unit stuff, we're trying to source ethically, source with consci conscientious in mind. And often developers will say to us, oh, but we want it for this price. And I'm thinking, well, if you get it at that price, it's gonna be broken in two years. You're gonna have to replace it. It's actually gonna cost you money. So let's actually, and, the, and frankly, the developers that don't wanna do that, we don't tend to work with them. But the ones who actually realize now the, op you know, the operational cost of rushing things and choosing cheap at the beginning, you're just gonna pay for it over the distance. And actually, if you're looking to buy um, support craftsmen, I think coming back to your heritage and the importance of heritage, I think uh, the skills of traditional craftsmanship or contemporary craftsmanship as well, there is a, uh, inevitably the human hand will slow down the making of those products. Um, so I think we talked about um, getting a chandelier or lighting from Murano and it's going to be beautifully made, but you know, the time frame is limited to make that. But the truth is, the you'll feel there's so much beauty in a handmade piece. You know, when you see people blow glass or, you know, they're turning, mo like, Jay, you're the expert, really, you should be answering this. But, um, you know, like, the truth is, there's, you, you feel the energy of the human that made it, and it comes into the whole house. It's, it's really special. Yeah, I, I, I think when you, when you look at pieces, especially something from, I would say, a, a vintage market or anything along those lines, it has been touched by someone and worked on by someone. Nowadays, You've got the likes of like Benchmark who are offering um, lifetime repairs because they value what they've done and what they've worked on to the extent where they're saying, if that breaks, we're going to fix it. No problem. And I think when you have something that is um, been made by someone, I think you cannot, I, I, I think it's, a, and I am not going to sound really bad what I'm about to say, but it's a lot better than something brand new as far as I'm concerned because you've got the kind of vintageness, you've got the knocks, you've got the kind of, history that is built into it and you can't do that with brand new and you can't imagine where that has been or who has owned it and how long it's lasted for whereas brand new it just is what it is and it's for me that's not what I deal with I deal with heritage slow movement and just going right back to basics and it provides I a totally story <laughs> yeah it provides a story as well um, and, and that's sometimes, you know, there's an emotion behind all of these things. And I mean, on, you know, your shows, it's all about, it's not, sometimes it's actually not about the piece. It's about the story behind the piece and not necessarily the people fixing it, but the person who owns it um, and, you know, the big reveal. And that takes time. I don't, it, 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 your show will be an hour long, but it actually probably takes, I don't know how long to fix some of those things, but a long time. Um, but it's also nice to use things that are personal to a client as well, and that, that can take time as well. We've created just recently for a client some benches in their entrance hall, which are made from timbers that have been felled from their own woodland. And that's really nice, but it takes time for that wood to dry out, and so I can't just go and buy it off the shelf. But the story is that it's from their woodland, and it's now in their house, um, and looks really lovely. Similarly, obviously, with, with new products, there is uh, the potential, isn't there, to talk to a client about a hand-knotted rug being made by a family in Nepal and the family there working together. And I don't know whether you get to the point of giving client updates so they can see the progression of their rug. And um, I mean, are, are there any other examples of that that you can think of? Once again, it comes down to the client. And uh, we do a lot of bespoke upholstery and upholstery, like once again, I'm totally taking all your points today. But it's it's a total art. And like, I get re I want to set up an apprenticeship for upholsters because they're really hard to find good upholsters. They are worth their weight in gold. And um, it's a real luxury to get some nice bespoke, you know, upholstery made, you know, 30 minutes down the road from you, you know? And actually there's a client in particular that we have and we're making these, like, 
we were just sending the updates and, and first of all we were like look we've got some photos if you want they, they excite us because we get excited when we see something that we've created and I think that's the beauty of design it comes from here to here um, and then they were getting into it so they they're <laughs> like wanting updates the whole time and I think that is like if you're in a position to get pieces made to actually be part of the journey once again while I know it might be new it does have a lot more heart than if they had just gone in and you know bought it off the shelf you know if, if you want to set up an upholstery um, some, there's a young lady there Leanne she is unbelievable uh, as an upholsterer female upholstery that's just and she runs if I'm not mistaken you run your own thing as well up in Bristol is that right speak up girl come on don't be shy yeah you're on it yeah so she is she's unbelievable absolutely unbelievable so it's, you're quite right upholstery is a skill that I think is dying and I think we need to train as many people as we possibly can and it does give you that kind of individualism that you can't get in a factory I'm not knocking any factories they do what they do but I just think the personal touch is the way forward just just touching on that I think that um, trying to reassure clients that things take a long time one of one of the ways of, of doing that is, is is actually if the designer one of us could try and actually get to grips with what upholstering a chair is like then you can obviously relay that to the client and uh, I'm really passionate about that and went and did an upholstery course for a week and made a chair and oh my goodness my hands hurt you know it's a huge big deal and after that I was able to say to clients well it will take a long time and hasn't the maker done a brilliant job it was made in actual real time. It wasn't mass produced, it's real time. You know, that's a really unusual concept for us. And my intention to slow everybody down and create slow interiors is actually to try different crafts so that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna become a brilliant gilder, but I'd love to have a go just so that I could say, yeah, it is hard. And the th this, you know, the thing we have made for you is gonna look beautiful and it will have taken ages. And if I can say that from my heart, I hope they'd believe me. <laughs> I can say that certainly about the chair I made. It took ages, and it, it was terrible, of course, but. <laughs> I, one other thing I wanted to say is that you mentioned about the show, and I think the shows that I do are very, uh, what's the word? They paint a kind of false picture to most clients or most people that are out there. So you would see the show, um, is an hour long and each item comes in for about 15 minutes of each of those uh, well each of that hour and you have roughly about I say we've worked it out to be about eight minutes for someone to fix that item so it comes in and goes out and fix it in real life it doesn't work that way that item will come in there's only a few items that will get fixed in a day but that's normally um, about six hours it would take for it to be fixed the majority of the items especially on the repair shop will come in and take at least anything between two weeks to uh, about six months to be repaired but on tv world you have to have it in 15 minutes you have to have it as eight minutes so most clients might think okay i've seen this on tv that's how long it's going to take i've ordered something from you i want it the next day it's like well, well it doesn't work that way we have to order fabric and sometimes the fabric house might be on a close um they might not be open so you have to order it before it's a bit of a nightmare that all the behind the scenes stuff you don't really get to see but then explaining that to the client when they have a belief that it's just done magically, boof, there you go, it's sorted. Um, isn't always the case. And we always want our clients to, to have the confidence in what we're doing, so we don't really want to tell them those stories about how hard it is, because they want to think that we can just do stuff. But it, yeah, it's hard and, and takes time, but we need their confidence. Let the professionals there smooth everything beautifully for the lay person. I mean, I th the thing I love about the programs is the engagement. I'm sure it must be the same, anyone that watches. Um, it's the sense of understanding the person that's made them and the personality of those people and their skills and watching it. And I think that is something that interior designers can bring um, to the homeowner that they're working with or, or the, the business that they're open, uh, working with as well as championing those craftspeople that maybe don't have such a big voice either um, and showing, you know, it will take... 12, 16 weeks to weave a rug and, and, and actually what's involved in that just brings so much more to the enjoyment of the end result, I think. I think one of the originals that was doing that even before the show started was, was you guys. You went up and down the country finding these people in these little um, workshops and then actually taking what they do and then open it up to 
clients all over the world. So really and truly, I think you are the original repair shop as far as I'm concerned. It's like I'm honored to be sitting here with someone who started off. Because she mentored me and Jade at the beginning. Yeah, she did. And um, when I learned about what you guys were doing, it's just like, wow, really? And the map that you had of all the different places up and down the country, that's exactly what I'm trying to achieve now. So um, thank you. Amazing. Well, it's it's all credit to to Lulu Little, but I mean, I'm equally passionate as she is um, about craftspeople and about finding small workshops who sometimes say to us, um, "Well, we don't really use computers, so could you fax it? <laughs> could you fax the drawing, or could you come over? You know, they're they're based somewhere really far away, but we love working with people like that. They're so special, and they're not on Instagram, and that's where we have." or they're not accessible on some sort of website. So that's where we have this amazing ability to sort of find these little little people and, well, fantastic people in little workshops here and there and just champion them. Just, you know, say, go for it and we'll buy it. What, you know, we'll, we'd love to buy the thing you're making. <laughs> um, what is it when you're buying new pieces that you would say we all need to look for to make sure that they do stand the test of time? Because I think that's the challenge, isn't it? To balance contemporary taste with something that's got longevity. Um, I'll go in first, because I'm going to be quite harsh. Um, so I'll let you guys smooth it out. I think if you're buying new pieces, it's all about the credibilities of that company and what they're doing for the future. I love people who have um, sustainability at the forefront. So people like Angle Poise and Benchmark, what they're doing with regards to uh, making sure that their product is always repairable, simple. That if the company's not doing that, we're not looking at protecting this planet for people who are not here yet. And that's the main thing. If they're not doing that, you're going to end up with a company that's producing a lot of furniture, ending up in a landfill site, and then there's people that are not here that are going to have to clean that up after. So um, that's what buying new is all about. Buying new is looking at the future. I mean, when I'm looking at new stuff, one of the things that I do is, is to try and pick it up. And if it's heavy, it generally it's probably made of, of decent materials. If, it, if it's not, then, um, uh, then it's probably something I'm going to be less interested in buying. And I think that's the challenge, because really there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in terms of manufacture. And we've recently had a, an experience of that where we thought we were getting something locally and then suddenly they were like, oh yeah, it's going to be delayed by four weeks. And we're like, okay, great. Well, can we see where it is? And they're like, oh, sorry, it's on the water. And it's like, on, on the water from <laughs> where? <laughs> like across the lake? And it's like, no, yeah, actually we ended up having, and, and you feel really good at about that. And what it was for us was a lesson in research. Like not only are we choosing nice things, I think the onus is on us to really vet the supply chain where we can. And we know certain bolts, certain things have to come from overseas. But actually, it, it's really to be honest with ourselves about where we're coming from. And we as a business have like seven different criteria that every new supplier has to kind of fulfill because it's even, it's down to, you know, the wage is being paid. That is really, really important because if the parents have been paid a certain wage, their children won't have to work. They'll be able to go to school. So, you know, th there's just a cost to everything. Every decision we make, there's a cost to it. So if we're gonna buy new, and we, you know, we can't get it, we just have to be mindful, and we have to be thoughtful. And, you know, it's amazing, actually, there's a stand here today. Um, you know, there's lots of amazing stands. Jewist, it's just as a small stand, it's on the other side there, but they've come up with this almost onyx-like finish. So onyx is really bad, not sustainable, re but it's beautiful, and it's natural, and you can light through it, and it's very luxurious. They have found this amazing crushed bottle supplier that is doing this finish that looks like onyx. And they're doing it in four colors. And it's so luxurious. It's so beautiful. It's made by crushed bottles. It's coming from Portugal. So it's relatively local, you know, <laughs> speaking. And like, that's what excites me now. It's that's when you are buying new, it's, and we're going to buy new. It's like, well, I've got that choice versus that choice. Let's make that choice. So I think it is about educating ourselves. Like lots of things, yeah. Um, I'm conscious of, we're, we're doing reasonably well for time, but I wanted to also explore how to design um, an interior that is able to evolve with your lifestyle, an interior that's able to evolve, um, different phases of life, so what the thought, 
a client may come to you with young children, but then you may get repeat business 10, 15 years down the line with a very different lifestyle. Um, so I just wanted to have your thoughts on evolution in terms of that. I mean, I'm always looking at, at that side of things because primarily my projects are residential. So um, the, one of the first questions is, do you have children? And then if they do, or, or, or d I mean, if, if they don't, I, it's difficult to ask if they're planning to. It's not. It's quite a hard question, but if they do, I know they're going to grow up, so I do need to plan ahead. So all of, all of the interiors that I do, if there are children involved, do have to do have to de develop. Um, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but but it, it's also things need to be hard wearing as well for kids. Um, I just installed a house actually now where the um, the whole family have been ill, and unfortunately one of the carpets is is now is now damaged, but we can we can clean it properly because it's made out of you know, the right materials. Um. Completely, and I think it comes back to what you've bought in the first place because things can be repainted, reupholstered, updated. So if it's a headboard, you can put a really fun kids fabric on, and if it's well made in five years' time, you could maybe put a corduroy or something more appropriate for the child's age. So I think it's it's like everything. It's just it's what you started off with and. How can that evolve over time? And I think there, I love that. I'm constantly looking at that. And as I said, I love when clients bring existing pieces with them because I feel we're just going to bring more of their story with us to the project. And similarly with the kids' furniture, you know, we've just converted. Um, it was like a jousting room, and they had like <laughs> ma quite amazing, like hand painted murals, which were appropriate for maybe a boy of six or eight at the time. Now he's 15, not so appropriate. And we've actually kept a lot of the original structures, but we've just painted them a flat color. So they've just modernized, but actually they've still got the detail. And so there's kind of looking backwards to look forwards, and I love doing that in the interior. I, I have a different, um, a different view on it in the sense that the clients that I get are normally retirees. So it's looking at the upholstery, looking at the chairs of making it higher, having higher arms. So really redesigning the chair that they love, that they've had in their house for years, just trying to make it more supportive of them. So sometimes we've had to hire up chairs, so adding stuff onto the legs, adding more support into the lumbar part of the, um, of the chair, and also out allowing them to have recovers, because this is another thing that some people are very, very interested in, just having where they always use a chair to get out of. It's just the arm covers are like, um, if you can get some of those just going off for people, and it's really easy to make those. As an upholsterer, that's right, isn't it? To make arm covers. And, that's something that can just keep someone happy within their house um, because they feel house proud as well. So it's not only always about the children, it's about us getting older and how we need to um, adapt with furniture. Sometimes you need something that's a little bit higher. The low seating doesn't work for you when you get over a certain age. Um, you can't get out of it. Yeah, it's impossible. Um, kids love it, but not the older generation. Um, there's something also quite fun about um offering clients a couple of sets of things. So we've, yeah, we've started offering, um, it's quite old fashioned actually, I think a lot of gl grand clients have always asked for sort of summer curtains and winter curtains. And we've started to, to suggest that now because actually that could, s that could make the client just pause about having an entire room redone and throwing everything away. It's actually, you know, it could almost sort of satisfy their desire just to sort of switch to the summer curtains which will really refresh the look and look so fab and then they can have a lot of enjoyment from that and we have different rugs as well so we have different carpets for summer and winter too and I think when I first started my career I'd never heard of anybody having two sets of anything you know lucky we've got one set in my house <laughs> so it hasn't sat very easily with me at all but actually it's a really positive way of making a house sort of be cha changing and sort of evolving and sort of moving and staying alive and it stops that static look that you can sometimes get in a house and it's a really really lovely thing to offer as well summer curtains winter curtains carpets and lots of loose covers for sofas everything changes um, we've just got about five minutes left so i'd love to see if anyone in the audience has any questions if you want to put up your hand you can get a microphone to you
Um, question to any of you, actually, but uh, with the increase in interest in having clients' own furniture restyled, what proportion would you say the demand is for purchasing new versus upcycling, essentially? I think it really comes down to the quality of that of that item, and and if you're changing the overall look of the room, if the room's staying the same, then we can make it good. But if the room is changing, it, it might not suit. But I'd maybe try and find another place in the property for a piece of a piece of furniture if it's particularly dear to that person. Um, but yeah, it depends if you're redoing redoing the whole house um, or, or, or room. We actually have a policy that we try and make at least 30%, and that probably doesn't sound very much, but actually 30% uh, is our kind of goal. And if we can get better than that, great. It just depends on the client, if they like antiques, if they like vintage versus, but that for us feels good. And that means we're either bringing items along with them or we're sourcing them. We're going to antique stores, vintage stores, markets, all that kind of thing, and re re-energizing, but that, that's the goal we set for ourselves and we try to do that. So most of the work that I do, clients bring their existing chairs to me, um, whatever it is, and then I, I, I assess it. Most of the time they've bought something that's quite good. I try my best not to um, raise someone's expectations of upholstering something that I don't think has been manufactured in the right way. That could be sustainability built into it. There are some manufacturers that just do it for a landfill so it's there to last for a certain amount of years and then I can't re-tack really onto it so um, I make sure that people are aware of what I can do um, and what they've bought so I always recommend if people can buy something really good to start off with and then you can always recover and recover and recover um, because the frame is solid so a good solid frame that's the best way forward um, yeah I totally agree with that and I think that I I've often encouraged people to buy really good pieces of furniture, even for a child's bedroom, and the child's seven or something. You think, gosh, isn't that a bit of a mad investment for a, for a seven-year-old who doesn't really know the, whether the chair's good or bad? But actually, if he still has it when he's 21 and it's really survived the test of time, then it's a huge cost saving. Yeah. Um, so my dad works in upholstery, my, uh, Georgian civil upholstery, and I'm joining him at the moment, so I'm quite new to everything. So my question is, um, how can I help my dad as a young business, um, business person, I guess, to help out reach new clients? Because obviously I'm a new person, and I tend to go to people around my age. So how can I reach to a bigger audience to come and get their items reupholstered because I believe, like you guys, it's important to use antique pieces with a lot of history and obviously, as you all know. So my question is, how can I reach out to get new audience or grow my business, getting more people? I, th I think you might have got 100 people just now. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really love to uh, see what you do, for sure. Um, everybody uses Instagram these days, and I know that it's it's a bit of a double-edged sword because it it's it's a horrible thing to get addicted to as well. But on a positive note, if you manage just to sort of you know just 20 minutes a day or something, um, it's fantastic for free advertising. And I I'm often scrolling at sort of 11 p.m. or something, and I and I find a new upholsterer or, or a new thing on Instagram, and I and I buy it or I contact the person. So your reach is huge with Instagram, absolutely massive. So that's just you know, I'm not in, in um, marketing and things, but that would just be my little first thought on the subject. Yeah, I think um, if you're looking to reach a, a wider audience, you're quite right. Instagram is the way forward. And seeing as you're younger, you should be fully aware of TikToks and all that kind of stuff that you can deal with. So I think if you can um, find something within the business, something that's kind of unique, not just straight upholstery. The thing that I don't like is the obvious. So like, this is what it looked like at the beginning and this is what it looks like now everybody does that do something that's completely different take a picture of your dad while he's sewing something go real into that detail when you look at what some people do i think for me the, 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 some of the best advertising on instagram or people that um, advertise their work where they're not advertising it are french upholsterers the way that they do their work on online is just it's 
it's kind of like sexy for me. As I'm an upholsterer, I get turned on by seeing someone dealing with a needle, doing all the horse hair and all that kind of stuff. But that's just me. And if you want to then bring in the audience or someone to buy your particular product, you have to show how much work goes into it. And a lot of work goes into upholstery. It's not just, oh, we cover it over and that's it. So you have to educate the audience that you're trying to bring in as well. Okay, and you only do that through stories. Okay, hey, that's our, our end of our allotted time. I just wanted to thank all of you for coming um, and thank all of our panelists. Hopefully we fulfilled our mission, which was to talk about the fact that slow interiors can honor heritage. It doesn't need to be stuck in aspic. Um, there's, you can buy and be frugal, you can invest for quality, and ultimately it's about an emotional connection that you're going to have with your home as a result, as well as the benefits of sustainability. So thank you very much for all of you for coming and sharing your thoughts.